set up on this table is a classic optics experiment to measure the Gaussian uh, parameters of a laser beam using a chopper wheel. Okay, so here we've mounted our laser. It's propagating through the uh, teeth in a chopper wheel and then illuminating a photodetector. Now, the idea is that as the, the chopper wheel spins, the tooth will pass in front of the beam, uh, obstructing more and more of the beam. And if we measure the power that makes it through, unobstructed, uh, that should look like the integral of the, uh, the beam profile. And we can observe that on an oscilloscope that's triggered by the pulses of light hitting the photodetector. So there's a few subtleties to do this, uh, to get this experiment to work well. Uh, the first thing we're going to want to do is make sure that our beam is traveling uh, horizontal in a level plane. And it's also particularly convenient if we can arrange for it to travel along a row of holes in the table, or at least parallel to a row of holes. So I've put together a little jig here that I can position on the table. Uh, I've got an iris on the end. And I'll adjust the location of this iris so that the beam passes through uh, when placed just in front of the, the laser. And now I can move this down to the other end of the table and observe if the beam passes through. If it doesn't, I can adjust the tip and tilt of this laser so that the beam does pass through. And then it's worth checking that the uh, initial point hasn't changed. Over here is my detector. Uh, I'm using a large area photo detector. I want to make sure that all of the light that makes it through this uh, tooth wheel illuminates the detector. And to avoid any uh, background light, I could operate with the room lights off, but that tends to be rather annoying. So instead, I've set up a little foam. This is a, a piece of pipe insulation. It's just a, a tube that I've mounted. And I'll place directly in front of the detector so that the beam passes straight through, but most of the ambient light gets blocked. OK, at this point, I can turn on the motor that drives my tooth wheel. And as it spins, I will see pulses on the oscilloscope that I can uh, observe and trigger on. So when you view your signal on the oscilloscope, you may see something like this. And at first glance, we can kind of see this uh, square wave pattern that we'd expect from the light passing through or not passing through, alternatively, the, the teeth of the chopper wheel. But if we don't see a steady pattern, it's, it's due to the triggering. Uh, currently, this is not set up to trigger off the channel that we're reading. So I want to adjust the trigger menu and tell it, in this case, to trigger off channel 1, because that's the uh, signal that I'm observing. And I want that to be. Uh, stationary in my waveform. And I need to make sure that the uh, indicator of the trigger level is within the range of my waveform so that the display gets updated. I may see a little bit of noise. I can always go into the acquire menu and average if I have a nice stationary waveform. And that will take care a lot of a lot of the noise for me. So now that I have this uh, nice square wave waveform, I want to zoom in on either the leading or trailing edge. I can adjust the location of my trigger or the height of my trigger to move the display around. And by timing the rate at which this rises, or more specifically, by measuring the rise time from the 16% point to the 84% point, uh, I've measured the time it takes for the chopper wheel to pass through one Gaussian beam radius. Now, I can do that using the cursors on the oscilloscope, uh, which is a pretty straightforward measurement, but it's also fairly slow. So there's a better way to do it, and that is to use the measurement menu. So if I go into the measurement menu, most oscilloscopes will allow me to measure various properties of a waveform. And the one I'm interested in here is the rise time. Now, typically, rise time is measured from the 10% to the 90% level. And I can, I can make that measurement and then convert uh, to the equivalent rise time over the Gaussian beam diameter. But here I can actually tell it what reference levels I want. So by setting the low level to 14% and the high level to 86%, I can have it read out the rise time uh, over the time that corresponds to one Gaussian beam radius uh, motion of the chopper wheel. 
I can then record that measurement value, multiply it by the velocity of the chopper wheel at the point where it's uh, passing through the beam, and I will have a measurement of the Gaussian beam radius at the location of the chopper wheel. And so once I've made a measurement of the Gaussian beam diameter with the chopper wheel at one particular location, I'll want to note how far that is from the laser, making sure to reference some uh, definable point on the laser so that other people who are using this measurement can come back and, and uh, make measurements from the same reference point. And then I can take this entire chopper and move it a few inches and repeat the measurement. And I'll continue to do that uh, along the range of distances available from the laser to the, to the detector. And by doing so, I can trace out the, uh, the Gaussian beam radius as a function of distance. And by using the, uh, the formula for the beam radius as a function of distance, I can do a curve fit and determine the Gaussian beam parameters. Uh, that's the waist size and its location. Uh, and one other free parameter is the wavelength, but typically I have other ways of measuring that or knowing that so that I can fix that in my model. Typically, with uh, most lasers, what we'll find is that the beam is, is more or less collimated coming out, and so we've got a beam that spreads out. Sometimes it's more helpful to actually measure the beam size as you pass through a waist. Your curve fitting tends to be uh, more accurate when you do that. And so you might take a well-known uh, or a lens with a well-known focal length, place it shortly after the laser, focus the light down to a waist, and measure from that lens on. Um, and then, of course, you'll be measuring the Gaussian beam parameters of the light after the lens, but it's a trivial problem to go back and calculate what the parameters were that illuminated the lens so that you know uh, what the beam shape is coming out of your laser. In this alternative version of the experiment, I've replaced the chopper wheel uh, with this rotating disc that has a very small pinhole in it. In fact, that pinhole is smaller than we would get uh, by puncturing a hole in a cardboard. Uh, we've used uh, some metal foil to make the pinhole and then put that foil over a hole in the cardboard. And as that pinhole passes through the beam, uh, it allows uh, or lets a little bit of the light at the location of the pinhole pass. And so as I turn that motor on that drives the pinhole, then I can observe the output signal on my oscilloscope. And so I see a, a spike every time the pinhole passes. So I'm triggering on that spike, and we can see that this time corresponds to one period of the disk. And if I zoom in on that peak, if the pinhole is much smaller, the pinhole diameter is much smaller than the Gaussian beam diameter, then what this shape traces out is the Gaussian beam profile in the direction that the pinhole is cutting through the beam. One common problem students encounter is they see a, a pulse shape that looks like this, that's highly asymmetric. Um, and the reason that we see this is most commonly that we're not actually measuring the width of the pulse here, we're measuring the uh, the response time of our detector. So the detector itself is uh, a photodiode that has a large capacitance if it's got a large area, and the internal impedance of the oscilloscope um, can be read off either, either printed or you can stick a multimeter into one of the ports, uh, but it's typically one mega ohm. And one mega ohm plus a large capacitance yields a slow response time, and that's actually what we're seeing here. So I've connected um, a variable resistor, a potentiometer, uh, in parallel with the input impedance of the oscilloscope. And as I turn down the impedance, the first thing we're going to see is the magnitude of the signal drops because the uh, impedance is converting the photo current to a voltage that the, resist uh, that the oscilloscope can measure. But the other thing that we notice is that this uh, trailing edge, which was highly asymmetric, is getting shorter as the response time gets faster and faster. And so eventually, I'll reach a point, I'm going to boost the scale here, where lowering the impedance no longer affects the width of this pulse. And I have a nice symmetric pulse. And once I've reached that point, then I'm no longer limited by the response time of my photo detector, and I can begin to do measurements.